Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Leon Hartwell. Welcome to our 20th LSE Ideas Russia-Ukraine Dialogue. We are now part funded by PeaceRep, an international research project led by the University of Edinburgh Law School, which delivers research and tracks data on conflict and its resolution. Ukraine has now retaken control of Kherson, a strategic city in the south. Following the February escalation, it's one of the first major cities occupied it was one of the first major cities occupied by Russian forces. Retaking Kherson represents another mammoth victory for the Ukrainian military, a military that has rapidly transformed over the past nine months. As we speak, Indonesia is hosting the G20 summit in Bali. A key concern on the agenda is the Russia-Ukraine war and its impact on stability, global markets, and food security. It's said that Western leaders are increasingly putting pressure on President Zelensky to sue for peace. The Ukrainian president revealed his 10-point peace plan to G20 leaders via a video address earlier this week. Today, we will be focusing on how the Russia-Ukraine war has impacted on three non-aligned states, India, Indonesia, and Turkey. We will also zoom in on their interests and responses to the conflict. These states are non-aligned in the sense that publicly they have largely been silent on Putin's aggression in Ukraine, and they've chosen not to impose sanctions against Russia in response to its actions. Arguably, non-aligned states play an important role in relation to the ongoing conflict, whether they take a strong stance or not. Turkey's trade, for example, with Russia has doubled during the first nine months of 2020 compared to the previous year and the Turkish market allows Russia to circumvent Western sanctions. Similarly, Russia's trade volume with India has quadrupled over the past year. To discuss non-aligned perspectives on the Russia-Ukraine war, it is my pleasure to welcome three distinguished guests. Uh, we are still waiting for one of the guests, uh, Dr. Desra Prakaya, ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the United Kingdom. Uh, so I hope he, he's not experiencing technical issues, but we hope he will join us. Secondly, I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Tanvi Madan, Senior Fellow in the Foreign Policy Program and Director of the India Project at the Brookings Institution. Welcome. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mustafa Katli, Senior Lecturer in Comparative Politics at Sydney University of London. Now. Um, Tanvi, I'm going to start with you. Um, let's turn to India first. Uh, India experienced colonialism and New Delhi has instituted sanctions against certain states in the past for what it considered grave crimes, including against apartheid South Africa. What explains India's current position? Why not push back against Russia's imperialist actions and atrocities in Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hartwell. It's uh, it's good to be with uh, with you, and thank you for hosting me and including me in this panel. Um, just a word about kind of India's approach to sanctions more broadly before I get to kind of India's approach uh, to uh, to the war uh, and the Russian invasion. Uh, India's generally had kind of the view um, of uh, sanctions that they should only be the kind of apartheid sanctions that you mentioned, uh, as well as when India kind of isolated and didn't deal with the Taliban regime in Afghanistan in the 90s were kind of exceptions. Uh, if you look at India's diplomatic history, they have generally tended to uh, uh, pr prefer uh, kind of only subscribing to UN sanctions. Um, Indian kind of private sector companies make their own decisions, but as a government, India tends to uh, prefer only to follow UN uh, instituted sanctions. But second, India's foreign policy, and this is not just uh, uh, about this government, previous governments as well uh, have talked about isolation not really being the greatest approach to reaching solutions, or for that matter, in this case, uh, end, ending the war uh, as they see it. And so they'll, they're, they're kind of, they want a return to dialogue and diplomacy and an end to this war. Uh, and India's view is you can't get there if you are just pursuing a strategy of isolation. And they mm -hmm. see sanctions in part uh, as leading to such isolation. Uh, one other thing to remember, India sees this through a prism 
uh, of a country that has faced sanctions itself. Um, Prime Minister Modi, uh, too, as an individual, uh, has faced sanctions. So uh, that is that is kind of its broader view of sanctions and uh, what it views as approaches that lead to isolationism or with us or against us approaches. I think in terms of the broader Indian approach to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think it's a, for India, it's a question of balancing various interests. Uh, on the one hand, India has not liked um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It indeed disapproves of it. Uh, it has not endorsed or supported it. It has not condemned Russia by names, but it has criticized Russian actions uh, without naming uh, Russia, whether that is the invasion it's, of it, itself and the violation of territorial Ukraine's territorial integrity or sovereignty, or it is uh, threats uh, or suggestions of nuclear escalation. So you've seen kind of India balance this by kind of not condemning uh, a, a longstanding partner uh, Russia, and it doesn't tend to criticize its partners by names in such fora, uh, but also uh, at the same time uh, criticizing the violation of various international norms, rules, uh, and law for that matter. I think this is a result of India kind of balancing two kind of different sets of uh, interests. One, on the one hand, um, India's own interests have been adversely affected uh, by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, whether that is Indian security interests, India is might be kind of non-aligned when it comes to between the Russia and the West. It is not non-aligned when it comes uh, to China. It has aligned with various Western partners to try to balance China in part because it is involved in a major border crisis uh, with China right now. And so for those security interests, it needs a, cons a consistent and sustainable su supply of military equipment and components from both Russia and Ukraine, that has been disrupted. So that's one interest of India uh, that has been uh, adversely affected. Uh, crucially, the, not just the Indian, uh, not just the global economy for India, but parochially the Indian economy as well. Uh, for India, it has uh, concerns that its economy, which was just trying to recover from COVID, has got another shock in terms of the Russian invasion and the fallout, particularly in terms of food, fertilizer, uh, and energy, uh, uh, food, fuel, and fertilizer uh, security and, and costs and the volatility uh, of prices as well. And that has affected India. Uh, India's markets are mostly in the West. And if Western economies suffer or have kind of inflation, their inflationary impacts, that will affect the Indian economy too. So it's not just, and it's this economic impact, but for Prime Minister Modi, who goes into seeking re-election in 2024, he's also worried about the political impact uh, of the economic headwinds potentially. Uh, and then you see kind of India worried about the strategic impact for its, its own interests uh, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, particularly worrying about uh, the increasing potential Russian dependence on China, India's major rival as the Indian government sees it, uh, and uh, seeing uh, potentially a deepening of Russia-China relations. It has been an Indian objective since the 1960s and even 1950s to try to stem the deepening of Russia-China ties. They have not succeeded in the last decade, and they're worried that the, Russia, the Russian invasion and the fallout will deepen uh, that, uh, those ties between Russia and China. Uh, and then, uh, you know, kind of worried also about what this does to both the West's focus on challenges in the Indo-Pacific. You know, there was concern at the beginning of the US paying far more attention to the European than the Indo-Pacific theater. Uh, and also concerned about, you know, the, the tension that this would, the frictions this would entail between India's relationships uh, with various Western partners who, frankly, on many uh, uh, and on many kind of uh, realms are actually closer to India or closer partners to India. But, you know, despite this adverse uh, impact, balancing this uh, is kind of the Russian, uh, the, the longstanding India-Russia partnership, uh, where Russia is less there are more divergences in India-Russia relations today. They are not what they were. Those relations are not what they were during the Cold War. Uh, Russia is no longer India's closest partner or broadest or deepest partner. But nonetheless, Russia, despite these divergences, uh, also remains relevant to key Indian interests. And India does not want to see whether it is the defense supply relationship, which as India is in facing crises at its border, India does not want to see disrupted. Uh, but also India has ties with, there are certain things that Russia cooperates with India in the nuclear defense and space uh, realms, for instance, 
uh, where India does not want to give up on that Russia relationship or uh, have a Russia that will go from uh, helping Indian interests uh, to, to, to harming it. And so uh, you have seen in India balance kind of the fact that it does not like what Russia has done, but also does not want to uh, uh, be in a situation where it is both either isolating Russia or doing things that will re lead to punitive Russian action against India, for instance, disrupting or stopping the supply, stalling the supply of certain kinds of military uh, equipment. So I think what you've seen is India essentially balance those two interests. And also you mentioned kind of India's imports, for example, of oil, uh, where India is trying to deal as it is grappling with these interests, also grappling with the fallout uh, of uh, the Russian invasion, including in terms of uh, energy prices. And so as various Indian ministers have said, uh, their primary interest is to make sure Indian, uh, India's energy security is taken care of. And if that means importing oil from Russia, which is not sanctioned thus far, they will do that uh, if it's in their interest. I'll end with saying, I think what you've seen in the last uh, a few weeks and, and perhaps months, though this was clear from the Indian statements very early on, that they would be happy to play a role if both sides um, would seek it in terms of getting, uh, uh, getting countries to, 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 to end this war. Uh, Prime Minister Modi, as people, probably your audience probably knows, was very clear that, uh, you know, when he said this is not an era of war uh, to President Putin uh, in, in uh, Samarkand at the, on the sidelines of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit. Uh, and uh, you've seen India, when it necessary, for instance, without naming Russia again, uh, talk about not uh, doing anything to escalate the situation, including uh, the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, but also been critical of the Russian uh, suspension of the Black Sea uh, Grain Initiative, for instance, which it played a role in helping uh, Russia get to yes on. So you've seen India say that it's open to playing any role that would lead to facilitate uh, the war, but you've also seen um, the Ukrainian leader Zelensky be very clear that, look, a ceasefire means uh, Ukraine giving up uh, a territory that Russia uh, has uh, captured and that it will not accept that. So you've seen uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, talk both to President Putin uh, and Zelensky, and I think they're open to it, but it's an open question uh, whether the two sides are ready for that path to dialogue yet that India seeks. Thank you, Tanvi. Yeah, that was a really good uh, overview, and thank you for introducing all those nuances also and how complex this relationship is between uh, Russia and 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 India, and we'll we'll talk more about Ukraine also later on because that's another part of the triangle that uh, India needs to to consider. Um, uh, Dr. Desra Prakaya, Ambassador, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Also, we're very happy to see you. And and given that you are uh, both an official and a scholar, um, we're going to ask you some tough questions today. Uh, we think you can handle it. Um, congratulations, first of all, also on hosting the G20. Um, I've been following the news and, and uh, we'll definitely weave in some questions related to the G20 uh, later on. But let's perhaps start off by um, uh, asking you, I'd like to ask you to explain Indonesia's uh, position on the war in Ukraine and how it has changed specifically over the course of this conflict. Thank you so much, Desra. Go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Leon. It's an honor for me to be back at the LSE Ideas, albeit virtually uh, this time, and certainly an honor as well to be on the same panel with Dr. Tafni Madan and Dr. Mustafa Kutlai. Indeed, the topic of our discussion is very timely, and I'm happy to share the Indonesia's uh, position. Going back to your, your question, uh, Leon, I think Indonesian, Indonesia's foreign policy is deeply rooted in the principle of independent and active, meaning that Indonesia's position on the war in Ukraine is guided by this principle, independent and active. That is why from the very beginning, Indonesia has been very clear and consistent adherence to the principle of international law and UN Charter, including respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty must be continuously upheld. This position gets us our 
a consistent voting pattern at the UN, especially General Assembly and Human Rights uh, Council as well. Now on your question about um, uh, how it changed uh, with regard to Indonesia's uh, relation with Russia and Ukraine, practically, Indonesia has good relations with both countries as it is deeply rooted in our long-standing tradition of non-alignment. Both Russia and Ukraine, just like the UK, are our important partners. Areas of cooperation between Indonesia and those two countries are very deep and very rich, not only involving government officials, but also business com communities, uh, academics, people to people, parliamentarians to, man to mention a few. And in terms of areas, I think it is very wide from politics, economic, trade technology, counterterrorism, religious affairs, and so many things. And more than that, we do also work together with Russia and Ukraine at the international forum. Now, given the current circumstances, of course, Indonesia does not want to be drawn into conflict, neither on the position to choose either country. Indeed, for Indonesia, we are deeply concerned with the continued and prolonged conflict marked by the escalation of violence. And we consistently call for a peaceful settlement. So far, we fail to see and understand the point of this conflict as it only causes for the sufferings of the civilians, exacerbating global food, energy, and financial crisis, which may lead to catastrophic consequences. And like many other countries, I think this is also the same with India, we cannot afford to see the escalation of world food crisis and energy, and what is also important, uncertain future. What we want, certainly, we want to see peace in Ukraine sooner than later, and for this reason, President Joko Widodo, President of Indonesia, visited both Russia and Ukraine last June to send the message of peace. We also provided uh, Ukraine with modest medical supplies, committed to the reconstruction of hospital in the country, and stands ready to contribute more assistance as needed. President Joko Widodo also participated at the international conference on the recovery, reconstruction, and modernization of Ukraine last month. And for us, for Indonesia, ending the war is very critical now, so that the recovery and reconstruction process of Ukraine could begin. That's my short reply, Leon. Thank you. Thank you, Desra, and thank you for being a good friend also of LSE, and, and, and welcome again. Um, uh, those are some some really interesting points, um, and we'll circle back to some of those issues. Uh, let's go to Mustafa next. Mustafa, um, Turkish-Ukrainian relations went from strength to strength for, for almost five years prior to the February escalation. Could you provide us with some context about those changes and, and also highlight for us how Russia's full-scale military invasion affected Turkey's relations with Ukraine and Russia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this, Leon. I mean, it's true that Turkey-Ukraine relations improved significantly over the years. Um, for instance, in 2011, high-level strategic council was established between two countries. So this was an important step to further institutionalize political and economic or diplomatic relations between two countries. And um, Turkey is also trying to uh, form different sorts of agreements with neighboring countries. And Ukraine is an important country in this context as well. For instance, Turkey and Ukraine introduced visa-free and even passport-free travel actually in 2017 to facilitate human mobility and especially tourism. Last year, for example, more than 8% of all tourists visited Turkey came from Ukraine. I mean, this makes around 2 million Ukrainian citizens visiting Turkey. So bilateral trade, I will say, is kind of modest, standing at $7.5 billion in 2021. But if you look at the long-term trend, we see that it has also increased uh, considerably over years, especially 
both countries are cooperating in key sectors such as um, uh, exporting and importing iron and steel products as well as uh, agricultural products, uh, especially grain. And they also cooperate in defense industry, especially Turkish drones acquired by Ukraine. As you know, this is a, an issue attracted a lot of uh, media attention recently. So clearly, I mean, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has had a major impact on regional and global context. And Turkey's position with every Russia and Ukraine also shaped within these broader uh, developments. And in order to understand actually Turkey's response to the war, I think we can look at two different levels, bilateral and systemic. Uh, it, on the on the bilateral level, Turkey, right from the initial phase of the conflict, supported territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. I mean, Turkey denounced Russia's, Russia's invasion and pointed out that this is against international law, undermining basic tenets of UN Charter. There is no doubt about it. And Turkey's approach is pretty much in sync with Western actors in this context. And by the way, I just wanna make this point that Turkey is part of Western alliance. I mean, Turkey is a NATO member since 1952. So it is one of the uh, long lasting uh, um, alliances in the modern world. Um, and on the systemic level, however, I think Turkey's approach to existing international order, therefore its approach to uh, Russia-Ukraine war kind of diverges from Western actors. I mean, over the last decade or so, for instance, we see that Turkey is trying to carve out an autonomous space in its foreign relations. I mean, sometimes this is called uh, Turkey's quest for strategic autonomy. So Turkish policymakers think that world order is moving towards some sort of multipolarity. As, and existing US-led uh, international order is not inclusive. I mean, Turkish president, for instance, made this uh, several times uh, in his speeches at the United Nations. You know, uh, uh, his uh, motto, work is bigger than five. I mean, Turkey is one of the countries asking for uh, reforms in United Nations Security Council in order to make existing global governance institutions more inclusive. And I, I will say that Turkey is also closer to the idea that security concerns or demands of non-Western actors, including Russia, by the way, are not adequately incorporated and addressed. I mean, the current international order is not inclusive from this point of view, and security concerns or other concerns of um, non-Western actors should also be incorpor incorporated. I mean, that's how actually um, uh, Turkish policymakers interpret um, existing uh, geopolitical turmoil going on Turkey's neighborhood. And when it comes to key uh, geopolitical issues in Turkey's neighborhood, um, Turkey and Western actors, especially United States, do not see eye to eye. I mean, this is the case in Syria, Eastern Mediterranean, Caucasus, and when it comes to the conflict in Ukraine, of course. I mean, this is one side of the issue, Turkey's changing relationship with Western actors, despite Turkey being a NATO alliance uh, ally. On, on the other hand, um, over the last decade, especially, Turkey's relations with Russia improved significantly. I mean, as part of Turkey's quest for autonomy and or balancing act, as it is sometimes called. So Turkey placed itself as a mediator or a broker in this conflict. I mean, Turkish policymakers made it clear since early days that Turkey will not cut off ties with Moscow or join uh, sanctions Western actors are imposing on Russia. I mean, Turkey wants to keep talking to both sides and tries to use its position as a kind of uh, leverage. And as, as a last word, and I'm gonna stop here actually, I think for Turkey, Developing more transactional relations with the West and convergence with Russia is not uh, only an outcome of geopolitical imp imperatives or security concerns. I think it is also a political choice and much to do with domestic political and economic developments over the last decade or so. But perhaps we can discuss this issue later in a bit more detail. Thank you. Yes, for sure. I would love to hear later um, about the personal relationship also between the two leaders and how that is impacting. Um, those relations. Um, but let's let's go back to Tanvi again, um, to India, 
Uh, could you could you could you shed some more light on the on the India Russia and India Ukraine uh, economic relations? And and I'd be very interested um, to hear what you have to say how this conflict has impacted on India's military dependence on Russian supplies, especially given that you you alluded to that earlier, how important that is. Thank you. So I think, you know, what's what's quite interesting is um, uh, several people, including me, have discovered more about India-Ukraine relations in the last kind of uh, 12 months than I knew before in terms of the economic and even kind of military supply relationship. Uh, one thing, um, as I think one of the, the, the your audience members, uh, Mr. Rashid Chaudhry asked, uh, partly India and Ukraine have had both a defense and economic relationship because Ukraine itself was part of the Soviet Union. And so you do see, um, you do see kind of that legacy relationship uh, still there. And you particularly saw it in three kind of ways. Uh, one is that as much as we talk about, you know, Indian dependence on military supplies from Russia, which is a, a key part of that relationship. In fact, perhaps the most crucial part, uh, the others have, have diminished considerably and I'll come to that. Um, you do see kind of that it is not just kind of Russian, so frontline uh, Indian military equipment, their estimates from anywhere from 65 to 85% of that frontline military equipment uh, is of Soviet or Russian origin. Um, but what you see is that India in, in, in you, you saw kind of even disruptions uh, from kind of the Ukraine defense uh, industrial base. Uh, which have affected India. So India's Antonovs, India runs one of the world's largest fleets of Antonovs. The Ukrainians were upgrading them and that's got disrupted. Um, the Russian, the frigates from Russia, the, the Navy frigates from Russia that India buys, uh, they had Ukrainian engines. Uh, that's been uh, disrupted as well. Uh, and there are various parts and components of various uh, equipment that India uh, has sourced from either the Soviet Union or then Russia uh, that have components from Ukraine, including tanks, uh, and helicopters as well. So it is not just Russia that India has had this relationship with. You've seen kind of Ukraine also be part of this defense supply chain and important. The second place I think you've seen this is uh, in terms of um, edible oils, for instance, or even wheat um, exports from Ukraine. Uh, Indians actually consume a lot of, for example, sunflower oil, most of which comes from Ukraine and to some extent from Russia. Uh, but that has been uh, kind of disrupted as well. Uh, and then you saw kind of uh, uh, very immediately, and in fact, it played a role in the approach India took uh, just after the kind of Russian invasion happened and just before it as well, uh, which is uh, you had uh, several thousands Indian, of Indian students in Ukraine. In fact, and this tells you uh, how the India-Russia relationship is not the same as it was or as deep as it was, there were more Indian students in Ukraine than in Russia. These are often medical students, but India had to evacuate them. And so you saw that education relationship. Several of them have actually gone back to Ukraine as well after having been uh, evacuated. So it's not that India has not had a relationship with Ukraine. It used to be sensitive about doing much with Ukraine because of Russian sensitivities. But in fact, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, kind of in 2021, uh, um, you did see, uh, so kind of months before the, the Russian invasion, you saw uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Zelensky actually meet uh, on the sidelines of a multilateral summit uh, with Prime Minister Modi promising to go to Ukraine. No Indian Prime Minister has gone for several uh, several years. And so uh, you saw him also allude to that again uh, when uh, Zelensky and Modi spoke uh, just a few weeks ago. So it is not that India does not have a relationship with Ukraine. Uh, just briefly in terms of the India-Russia uh, uh, military uh, and economic relationships, and I, I know I've uh, gone on a bit long, but just very briefly, uh, actually before these Indian imports of oil, uh, Russia and India do not have much of an economic relationship uh, beyond the kind of the defense trade space. That was the major kind of, uh, the major kind of uh, dependence uh, in terms of India-Russia trade uh, pre-Russian invasion, it was $10 billion. Just to compare that with, India, uh, even India-China trade is kind of 10 times that, if not more. Um, and so there was, in fact, there was an attempt, there have been for years, India and Russia have talked about diversifying the relationship beyond defense trade with little success beyond some areas in energy. Um, so, you know, this en energy kind of imports from 
Russia oil in particular, uh, it is it has gone up. But as the Indian foreign minister recently alluded to when he was in Moscow, it is not sustainable to have a long term relationship on oil imports alone, because for India, it still makes sense for them to return to importing more from the Middle East and Africa, which are its traditional suppliers. Uh, defense trade, just very quickly, India in any case has been diversifying away from its over-dependence on Russian military equipment, uh, both in terms of producing at home uh, and seeking other, uh, um, other sources, including the US, France, Israel, South Korea, and others. So what you've seen is, uh, and I, I, that trend I think will continue, particularly India wanting to produce more at home in the defense space. So that dependence will decrease, but it will not go away entirely. Uh, and India will not seek to cut off uh, ties with Russia, even if that dependence goes down uh, considerably. Yeah, on those issues of procurement, they, they always take a long time uh, before they actually happen. So it's something to look out for in the coming months and, and, and years even. Um, but, but thank you for that. And, and I'm sure uh, a lot of IR courses have to be updated because we're learning so much about uh, these nuances uh, and uh, relations between these different states and and as you said we're we're going through a process of self-discovery also um, uh, let's turn again uh, to you Desra um, and, and talk a little bit about Indonesia's G20 presidency uh, which is which is ongoing uh, I think day two now um, could you comment on Indonesia's uh, diplomatic strategies with regards to the Ukraine-Russia war and how this corresponds to Indonesia's foreign policy and what are we seeing uh, happening right now uh, at, at, at the G20 summit? I mean, what, what's interesting is not only what's there, but also what's missing. And, and from, from what I could gauge in the news, for example, um, already there's, there's no family photo scheduled uh, on the agenda, um, uh, Putin is also visibly uh, missing. Uh, so tell us what what insights can you give us? Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Uh, very, very difficult, uh, challenging uh, question. I'll do my best uh, to reply to your, your question. Um, Indonesia took the presidency from Italy uh, in the time of uh, pandemic COVID-19. And considering the G20 mandate, the focus of our presidency is, of course, the post-pandemic global economic recovery. Recover stronger, recover together, recover stronger. And priority areas are health, digital transformation, and energy transition. And of course, amidst uh, rising geopolitical tensions, especially Russia-Ukraine war, the geopolitic situation, geopolitical situation has become more complex. And at the same time, we also face multi-dimensional crisis, including climate change, which has caused economic downturn, increased poverty, slowed global re recovery, and hindered the achievement of the SDGs. Those conditions pose direct challenges to G20, as well as to Indonesia's pre presidency. However, we remain focused to make G20 a catalyst for global economic recovery. We have to maintain G20 intact, leaders' high-level attendance high, as well as substantive outcome in the form of declaration. I think it has been uh, broadcasted and also uh, shared in the news that the sticking point is well known, the langu language in the Russian-Ukraine war. However, for Indonesia, it is more than just leader decla leaders' declaration. We want to do extra miles. From various preparatory meetings, we have identified some concrete deliverables, 243 proposals from countries and 43 proposals from international organizations, which will benefit all, especially developing countries. And some notable achievement, agreement to establish the financial intermediary, intermediary fund which has raised US dollar 1.4 billion for prevention of future pandemics, establishment of digital innovation network, various collaboration for clean energy and reduction of carbon emission. And lastly, the launching of just energy transition partnership. Indonesia will continue to work hard to ensure 
G20 delivers. All G20 members have collective responsibility to this end. And Indonesia, along with the next three successors, Brazil, India, and South Africa, ha also has a responsibility to resonate the voice of the global, global South. Mind you, G20 is not intended to resolve the current crisis in Ukraine and Russia, but it has implication definitely. If I may, um, a little bit touch upon the what Mustafa has said earlier on the inclusivity. Um, Leon, if you look at the uh, resolution in the General Assembly, I think the, the first and second in which the resolution received a vast majority support, 141 in favor, and then 140 in favor for the second resolution, uh, for 24th of March. And however, if you look at the third resolution adopted on the 7th of April, I think there has been a significant uh, decrease in support, 93 in favor. Again, I think I'm touching on the issue of uh, inclusivity, I think Mustafa rightly pointed out. And again, there is a tendency from uh, the North countries, the, 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 the global countries, developed countries, the North, the uh, Northern uh, the developed countries to take things for granted. Because for us, the implication is not only about between Russia, Russia, Ukraine in Europe, but the implication is far reaching too many of us in the global south. So I think inclusivity is very important, not only talking about the substance of the resolution, but the process and the, 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 the process, the ownership, and also the inclusivity. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much, Dejo. And um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting, this point on uh, inclusivity. Um, and, and I mean, it would be really interesting to have a, personal discussion one day on, on what has been done in terms of uh, how this Russia-Ukraine war has been discussed behind the scenes be between some of these leaders, you know, coming from different parts of the world. Um, but I think it will take a long time before that type of information will reach the public. Let's go to uh, Mustafa again. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about and what changes you've been observing in terms of trade and investment between Turkey and Russia and Turkey and Ukraine? And, and what does that tell you about President Erdogan's ability to continue to deal both with Kiev and Moscow? Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you very much, Leon. Actually, as you know, Turkey did not join sanctions imposed on Russia by the Western actors. And Currently, Turkey has strong economic linkages with Russia in different areas, like energy, trade, and investments, including security sector. I mean, for instance, Turkey's dependence on Russian gas is around 40%. And this is the case, despite Turkish officials have been trying to diversify Turkey's uh, energy sources. And Turkey's trade relations with Russia also surged since February. And in this context, I think Turkey is one of the interesting countries to examine. Um, in further details, along with India and some other countries in the global south. Because according to a Euronews article, for instance, between March and September this year, I mean, seven months following uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, total trade volume was almost $41 billion. I mean, this is the highest trade volume compared to the same periods in previous years over the last decade. And this is clearly a significant increase. And just to put things in context, for instance, bilateral trade between Russia and Turkey was around $35 billion in 2021. So most probably if things go as projected, uh, most probably total trade volume this year will kind of double. So this is an important transformation in the trade front. And the important point, however, is that Turkey's economic relations with Russia is kind of asymmetric. I mean, it is pretty much working in favor of Russia. Uh, export import ratio for Turkey is around 20%. So Turkey uh, imports sig significantly more than it exports to Russia. And this brings some difficult questions to the forefront, especially regarding Turkey's financial statecraft and how things might turn in the medium and long term. Because Western countries, especially the European Union, 
is still Turkey's largest trading partner. I mean, bilateral trade is on a much more balanced footing when it comes to Turkey-EU uh, trade relations. And also almost 70% of Turkey's inward foreign direct investment comes from the West. So Turkish banking system is also uh, pretty much dependent on the European and American financial systems or regulations. So as you see, there's kind of a, a delicate situation here. Uh, it is whether Turkish economy is sanction proof enough if Turkey's relations with the West further deteriorate in the following months. I mean, in the current context, obviously Turkey is positioned itself in a unique uh, 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 negotiation uh, or negotiator or broker uh, point because uh, Turkish policymakers, as I mentioned, would like to talk to two sides at the same time. And from the West's point of view, I think Western actors do not want to lose Turkey and push the country too much over the other side of the fence towards Russia. And on the other hand, Turkey has probably gained some sort of strategic leverage over Russia since uh, February. I mean, if you look at the last five years, I'm talking about uh, pre-Russian uh, invasion period, the bilateral relations were pretty much um, uh, controlled by Russia, I will say. I mean, in terms of trade, in terms of investments, in terms of cooperation in key security uh, issues and areas. But since uh, February 2022, I will say that uh, Turkey gained some sort of leverage vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I mean, Turkish policymakers are acting as uh, mediators. Actually, they are playing an important role in this context. So uh, the thing, however, is that uh, Turkey is currently enjoying double tolerance, if you like. I mean, the Western actors do not want to lose Turkey. And on the other hand, actually, Russians know that Turkey is an important actor in the current context. But this actually requires kind of delicate balancing, if you like. Because if, for instance, Western actors think that uh, sanctions should be extended, including other countries, then this might be a little bit problematic for Turkey and difficult decisions might uh, have to be done on part of the policymakers. Uh, I'm not saying that this is gonna happen because I mean, we are moving towards some sort of a multipolarity and states might have uh, bargaining space and actually have some sort of uh, autonomy in dealing with uh, economic and political issues. But the point is that, I mean, Turkish economy is kind of a difficult situation right now and domestic capacity does not seem strong enough to weather possible financial outflows or reversal in foreign trade and tourism revenues. That's why actually Turkey wants to continue trading with Russia. I mean, Russian tourists coming to Turkey is, is quite important for a Turkish economy. And of course, Turkey's economic relations with the West uh, still matter a lot um, because Turkey is a country that has a current account deficit. And in order to ensure uh, economic growth, Turkey needs to attract foreign capital. And most of this capital still comes from uh, Western countries or Western economies. So in this context, uh, what I'm trying to say is that Turkey has positioned itself as a mediator and so far it has made significant contributions uh, because, you know, uh, prisoner exchange deal, uh, grain deal, and uh, uh, all uh, diplomatic efforts bringing both sides together and also bringing other stakeholders, for instance, security officials, intelligence officer, officials uh, from the United States and Russia uh, met in Turkey recently. So Turkey is doing uh, different sorts of diplomatic uh, uh, negotiation stuff and uh, trying to bring parties together. But this is a delicate situation and there's a lot of uncertainty right now. Thank you, Mustafa. Yeah, um, we'll come back to this, the issue of mediation also uh, momentarily. Let's first go back to Tanvi again. Um, you know, you mentioned something earlier about how uh, uh, Russia is becoming more dependent on China, which, which is, a, is a big deal for, for India, some would argue. Uh, what, what do you think this means for India, given New Delhi's rivalry with Beijing? Thank you. Um Thanks, Leon. I think, you know, it's, it's India will watch this, the, this development very carefully, what the, this, the war's impact will mean on Russia, China relations, even before the invasion, the February 4th statement, which suggested a far deeper 
uh, relationship between Russia and China, but also the fact that they uh, it was almost an anti-West manifesto. Now, India has actually been in, in various non-West platforms and participated with uh, these two countries in BRICS, for example, in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. There's a Russia-India-China trilateral. But for India, these groupings had utility as non-West platforms. Uh, there's limited utility for them, uh, for India, uh, from India's perspective, as anti-West platforms. Uh, given India's own partnerships with various uh, Western company, uh, countries and the fact that its own economic transformation is far more dependent uh, on the West uh, than it is uh, Russia, for instance. Um, but I think more kind of strategically and geopolitically, why uh, a potentially a, a much and even closer Russia-China relationship has implications for India. Uh, one is kind of on the, on the kind of more strategic uh, side, uh, India, while it has traditionally kind of thought of, you know, the US, uh, Australia, Japan, France, others as part of its balancing strategy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China, it has also uh, wanted Russia to be part uh, of that balancing strategy. The India-Soviet relationship in, indeed was forged, and the treaty they signed in 1971 uh, was in no small part, uh, from India's perspective, to balance uh, and counter China. Uh, and same for uh, Russia as well at the time. So for India, they have preferred it when Russia and China are apart rather than uh, together, because it, India would want to see Russia more broadly uh, as part of a balancing strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. More kind of uh, operationally, there are kind of, I think, the two things that India would worry about with a closer Russia-China relationship, and particularly growing Russian dependence uh, on uh, China. Uh, I think it's kind of, to put it succinctly, the question India will have, as one Indian commentator put it, what will a Russia that is more beholden to China do uh, if China asks it to take actions that go against Indian interests? Uh, and the one thing that they, they mentioned, uh, which we have seen, is that increasingly over the last few years, even pre-invasion, uh, Russia has been bandwagoning with China at the UN Security Council in ways that have been unhelpful to India, uh, and not just at the UN Security Council, but more recently in groupings like BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where Russia is deferring to China even on questions that are of great interest to it, uh, uh, great parochial interest like uh, Central Asia, and so for India, they're thinking more broadly, which is. Uh, what if uh, China, for instance, uh, asks uh, uh, Russia to do more with it in the Indo-Pacific, which Russia has not done uh, so far? Uh, what if uh, Russia, China asks Russia uh, to not uh, to, to put pressure on India not to sell the Brahmos missile system to the Philippines, uh, which is in India, uh, the system has been developed jointly by India and Russia. But even more parochially, and I think this is crucial for India, what would a Russia more beholden to China do if there's another crisis and escalation at the China-India border? India does not expect Russian support. It, it does want Russian neutrality between China and India and Russia to continue to supply uh, military equipment and components and parts. Uh, for India, this is not an abstract concern that it would make a, a material difference if Russia moved from neutral to taking China's side. And it's not abstract because when India and China fought a war 60 years ago, at that time, Moscow needed Beijing uh, and Moscow took ally China's side over, uh, over friend India's uh, and uh, did stall the supply of military aircraft, its fighter aircraft to India, uh, as well as provided intelligence on India uh, to Beijing. So for India, it is perhaps one of the things it's watching most closely is the China-Russia relationship. And I think it will look for signs, uh, both of kind of potential friction, uh, but even more crucially, it will look for signs that Russia is bandwagoning and more beholden uh, to China than it was before. Thank you. A, a really interesting political economics case study also there uh, in, in the making, um, uh, because there is ultimately a lot of crossover between what happens in the political sphere and also what happens in the political sphere and how those things interact with one another. And so thank you for drawing our attention to that. Um, let's go to you, Desra, again. Um, we've talked a little bit about 
uh, Indonesia's foreign policy issues, and, and we can tease out some more later on But if, if there's time. But I want to turn to the domestic environment momentarily. Has the, the, the Russia-Ukraine war, uh, how, how has it impacted on Indonesia domestically and specifically with regards to security and economic issues? Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Uh, Leon, I bet you have uh, followed closely the the, the uh, discussion domestically in Indonesia. Uh, there are indeed uh, some immediate impacts uh, to Indonesia. The majority of our imported wheat uh, is coming from Ukraine. I think uh, 2020, I think we recorded 2.96 million tons. Um, reduced, uh, however, now uh, activities in Ukraine ports, but also significant uh, effect on the supply with Indonesia, a major consumer of noodle, noodles. I think this is a, a very clear impact. Dis disruption in the in the supply of crude oil to the international market and consequently rising commodity prices. I think it has resulted in long-term inflation on top of the inflation caused by the pandemic, as is the case elsewhere around the world. And against this backdrop, Indonesia's, Indonesia continues to show one of the most stable macroeconomic conditions, thanks to our strong domestic market, as well as uh, coordinated and prudent fiscal and monetary policies. Our, our outlook is positive uh, for 2023. We strive to provide targeted price subsidy and direct social transfer to cushion from high global energy and food prices. Inflation is projected to remain well controlled around 1.3% by the end of this year and will be within our targeted range in the first half of 2023. Indonesia will also carry on with its agenda of sustainable economic growth this is consistent with the theme of Indonesia's presidency of uh, G20. Through synergy and collaboration, we will recover together, recover stronger. Now, going back uh, to your question on public sentiment in Indonesia, Indonesian citizens tend to view the situation in Ukraine through the prism of other conflicts. More than 90% of Indonesia's 270 million people are Muslim, and support for Palestinian rights has traditionally been high. That's why we want to make it very clear, and Indonesians want to make it clear, they want peace in Ukraine. And at the same time, the general mood is critical against the moral framing of the issue double standard in which Israel terrorizes Palestine, but Ukraine is an issue. What is clear is that Indonesia remains a keen proponent of engagement, not isolation. At the G20, Indonesia does not want to see its agenda hijacked by geopolitics. Instead, Indonesia wants all sides to find a common ground and focus on ways to engage in mutually beneficial collaboration. We are still working on that, Leon. Thank you. Thank you, Basra, and, and also for, for highlighting that, that this conflict, of course, has impacts way beyond the borders of uh, you know, uh, uh, Ukraine and, and Russia, um, a, an issue that we consistently come back to during our Russia-Ukraine dialogues. Um, let's go again to Mustafa. Um, can you tell us how is Turkey's response to the Russia-Ukraine war? Um, how has it been affecting Turkey's standing in NATO? Uh, well, um, Turkey is a NATO member since 1952, right, as I mentioned earlier. So when Turkey became a member, there were 14 NATO alliances, including Turkey and Greece. Now, as you know, there are 30 NATO members. So Turkey is a long-standing member of Transatlantic Alliance. I mean, Turkey's uh, security relations with the West are highly institutionalized. 
And within the context of NATO, actually, Turkey played an important role over the last seven decades. Um, however, recently, um, there are certain issues that drive a wedge between Turkey and some NATO members, um, especially with the United States. For instance, Turkey and the United States do not see eye to eye regarding civil war in Syria. And Turkey's side thinks its legitimate security concerns are overlooked by allies. And Turkey also experienced some sort of problems um, when Turkish authority, authorities decided to purchase S-400 missiles from Russia. I mean, as you know, these missiles are not compatible with NATO system and Turkey's NATO allies criticized Turkey's action uh, significantly at the time, but um, the Turkish side did not step back and it is a done deal now. Um, recently also, there are uh, certain issues uh, with Turkey and some wannabe NATO members. Uh, for instance, Turkey blocked uh, Sweden and Finland's NATO membership applications. And uh, I mean, most of the people actually kind of link this discussion with Turkey's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But I think uh, there are certain issues actually Turkey uh, asked their counterparts to do before actually uh, Turkish authorities authorize or approve uh, Sweden and Finland's NATO membership. I mean, Turkey wants two things from their counterparts. Actually, the first one is to lift ban over arms sales to Turkey because there are certain restrictions and some NATO members do not uh, export arms um, to Turkey or do not export uh, uh, defense industry items. And this is a concern for Turkish policymakers because Turkish authorities think that uh, there are significant geopolitical risks around Turkey's geography. I mean, on the one hand, there is a civil war going on in Syria. On the other hand, state structures collapsed in several Middle East and North African countries over the last decade or so. And it creates all sorts of security problems or challenges, uh, including uh, irregular migration. And Turkey is now hosting uh, more than 4 million Syrian refugees in Turkey. And that's why actually Turkey has some uh, significant security concerns and uh, Turkish authorities would like to cooperate more with uh, European countries, especially when it comes to uh, defense industry. So basically Turkish authorities ask their counterparts in Sweden and Finland to lift ban uh, over arms sales to Turkey. And the other thing is that Turkey wants those countries to act more vigorously when it comes to dealing with certain uh, individuals uh, affiliated with PKK um, terrorist organization and residing uh, in those countries. So PKK is recognized um, as a terrorist organization by Turkish authorities. This is also the case for the EU and the United States. So Turkey wants their um, um, counterparts in Sweden and Finland to act more proactively on that front as well. But finally, I must say that uh, anti-Westernism and anti-Americanism uh, also serve as a kind of winning strategy for the government and bring some sort of populist dividend in domestic politics. So until now, actually, we have uh, analyzed the issue from geopolitical point of view and try to place within the shifting international order. That's absolutely right. I mean, this is one of the most important debates in our time, but we should also be aware of the fact that domestic politics and foreign policy interact with each other. And this actually makes things a little bit more complicated. So that is how actually uh, Turkey's um, relations with NATO members evolved over the last decade or so. Thank you, Mustafa. Yeah, and, and, and I think, I mean, it was interesting how you alluded earlier to uh, the kind of bilateral and the systemic issues, and then there are the personal relationships between the two leaders that adds another dimension, as well as the, the purchasing of, of these S-400 missiles, which, which uh, I would say unconventionally led to sanctions of a, of a of a NATO country by other NATO countries, which was also interesting. Uh, so, so how this will play out for Turkey uh, is something to watch out for uh, in the coming months, whether uh, President Erdogan will use uh, what's happening on the battlefield to his advantage uh, to uh, maybe gain traction on other issues that are important to 
Turkey or, or how far he will be able to do that will also be um, something to, to look out for. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time, but I really want to thank all three of our panelists, uh, Ambassador Desra Prakaya, uh, Dr. Tab Tanvi uh, Madan, and Dr. Mustafa Katli, Katli for your wonderful insights today. Um, I think it's really important to continue to uh, to to have this type of discussion, uh, especially with with our uh, non-aligned uh, 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 with 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 non-aligned perspectives also to to get a sense of how this conflict impacts on on your respective countries and 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 what to expect in the coming months. Um, so thank you for all three of you for your time, and and I hope to see you back here. Uh, around the Russia-Ukraine dialogues table. Um, I also want to remind our audience members that you're welcome to register for future Russia-Ukraine dialogues. Uh, my colleague has dropped a link in the chat session uh, section of 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 uh, uh, of of this um, uh, of the Zoom room. So uh, uh, please register for the upcoming event on energy. Also, uh, thank you so much to everyone, and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Leon. Thank you, Dr. Madan. Dr.